Sailors who serve on submarines are an interesting bunch. Packed in like sardines with their fellow bubbleheads, as they're sometimes called, it could understandably be an isolating experience. Out of these weeks and months spent together under the sea, they've developed a lexicon of jargon you won't hear anywhere else. Angles and dangles, not to be confused with egg angers, bull george, goat locker, the phantom shitter, pillows of death, aka canned ravioli. The unique odor of a submarine is described as a mixture of ramen, fish, and feet. Apparently this provides the perfect atmosphere for hazing the new guys with tricks like the male buoy, machinist punch, and the bulkhead remover. Feel free to look those up, they're pretty hilarious. I suppose what I'm getting at is, this is a small, unique bunch with a lot of personality, but they're totally misunderstood by the rest of the Navy and the military at large. Submarine pitchers in the baseball world can relate. Submarine refers to the extreme arm angle they utilize, which is not to be confused with sidearm pitching. Submariners come from underneath, more like a softball pitcher than anything. A lot of these guys are nearly scooping up dirt. This arm angle causes the opposite trajectory on their pitches in comparison to traditional overhand pitching, of course. In turn, this makes pitches hard for the batter to pick up. There's no ability to overpower a batter, as submarine fastballs generally top out in the mid-80s. It's all about deception. The technique is unusual, and therefore rare. There's never been a large number of submarine pitchers in professional baseball, but they never seem to fully fade away either. Seems like every time a submariner like Darren O'Day enters the sunset of his career, a new, exciting submariner enters the league and carries the torch like Tyler Rogers from the Giants' bullpen. There's not a single submarine pitcher in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but that's not to say they haven't seen their share of success. Today we're going to dive deep into the origins of an often misunderstood player type and profile some of the best to ever do it. Before we get rolling, if you would, please like and subscribe, help break down the outfield walls that stand between small ball creators like me and a good audience. Drop me a line, let me know what you think. Here we go. Cy Young was noted as one of the first to utilize the submarine style, but he would mix it in intermittently with overhand pitching. Nonetheless, a legendary player is linked to the style. Jack Warhop was the first true submarine pitcher, meaning it was the sole technique he used to get outs. Warhop was a West Virginian who rode the submarine out of the coal mines and onto the Yankees roster. He had his ups and downs. Baseball Magazine once called him the unluckiest pitcher of all time. Call it bad luck, call it karma, true submarine pitchers didn't exactly get off on the right foot reputation-wise. You see, the next one to fully commit to submarine pitching was Carl Mays, on the tail end of the dead ball era. I'm saying dead ball as ironically as I possibly can, because he's the only player in history to injure another player on the field, and it directly result in death. On August 16, 1920, Mays, who was with the Yankees at the time, hit Cleveland Indians batter Ray Chapman in the head. Chapman was unable to get up off the dirt and was assisted by his teammates. Mays never left the mound. Upon arrival at the hospital, they found Chapman's skull was fractured. They operated on it, but he'd die in doctor's care the next day. Needless to say, this cemented Carl Mays' reputation as a headhunter for the rest of his career. He would often feud with Ty Cobb, and honestly, he's probably one of the few players who was even remotely as hated as Ty Cobb was. Carl Mays won two World Series with the Red Sox and two with the Yankees. He was the Major League wins leader in 1920, and though Mays wasn't the first to utilize the submarine style, his nickname, Sub, suggests that he was the pitcher who gave the style an identity within the game. Mays retired in 1929. Eldon Submarine Auker debuted in Major League Baseball in 1933. Porter Moss debuted in the Negro Leagues in 1933 both filling the role as the lone submariner in their respective leagues. Auker with the Detroit Tigers, Moss with the Cincinnati Tigers. Eldon Auker would get a ring in 1935, 
During this postseason run, he was the first interview of a young Chicago Cubs broadcaster, a one Ronald Reagan. It was his first big break. Auker was the longest lived of all the 1935 Tigers, dying at age 95 in 2006. Alternatively, Porter Moss died tragically at age 34. His team at the time, the Memphis Red Sox, were on the way home for a doubleheader when their bus broke down, landing the team on an overcrowded Jim Crow era train car. A drunk passenger was allegedly pestering a woman on the train. Moss tried to intervene and was subsequently shot. A doctor boarded the train to administer aid to a white passenger, but refused Moss medical attention because of his race. Auker and Moss, as similar as two players could possibly be on the baseball field, two totally different lives because of their circumstances. Ted Abernathy was the first pitcher we'd see totally rejuvenate his career by going submarine. He pitched for the Washington Senators from 1955 to 1957. He was so-so at best. He'd undergo shoulder surgery in 59 and re-emerge in the minors with a submarine delivery that eventually yielded success. He got called up to Cleveland in 1963 and saw nine more years in the majors with six different teams. Abernathy would start the trend of submariners being leaned on for bullpen duties. He would notch 149 career saves. He retired in 1972. 1974 saw Kent Tocolvi come onto the scene and carry the submarine through the 70s, culminating into a 1979 World Series championship. Tocolvi was an absolute workhorse. He's one of only two players in history to appear in 90 or more games in a single season. One of his 90 game seasons occurred when he was over 40 years old. He's the only one to ever accomplish that. He holds the National League record for innings pitched in relief with 1,436 and two thirds. Here's a weird record. The most career losses without having given up any earned runs. This happened to him 12 times. That's some Jack Warhop ass bad luck right there. Gene Garber was also slinging it submarine style during this time in a career that spanned almost 20 years. Nine of these seasons were with the Atlanta Braves. He's third on the team's all-time saves list. He's fifth in career pitching appearances with 931. The eccentric Dan Quisenberry would headline the submarine pitchers of the 1980s. He's the most decorated submarine pitcher of all time. He was a three-time All-Star and a 1985 World Series champion. He was the five-time American League saves leader and a five-time Rolaids relief man of the year. Quisenberry couldn't overpower the hitter, but he induced ground balls as well as anyone in history. One of the more quotable players of all time, he said, quote, I'm probably the only player who has more saves than strikeouts. Also, quote, Reggie Jackson hit one off of me that's still burrowing its way to Los Angeles. And one more for good measure, quote, the best thing about baseball is there's no homework. They don't make them like the quiz anymore. All right, Dan, all of them right on the black. Wow, we can't get much sharper than that. Popularity isn't really a word I'd like to associate with submarine pitching, but if there were a peak popularity for submariners, it was the late 80s and the early 90s. The Mets bullpen featured Terry Leach. The Blue Jays bullpen featured Mark Icorn. I called him Mike Acorn in the last take, glad I caught that. And the Phillies bullpen featured Todd Froworth. Steve Olin made the pitch his own in this era. He made his way from the Cleveland bullpen to the mound to the tune of the Beatles' Yellow Submarine over the PA. Of course he did. Chad Bradford would enjoy a long career as the most prevalent American submariner in the 2000s, and Shunsuke Watanabe would dazzle in Japan at the same time. He had what's widely regarded as the lowest submarine release point ever. Pretty incredible to watch. My takeaway from a day of submarine research is this. You don't always have to be the best athlete to win. Just be the weirdest guy on the field. Hey, just be yourself. Take it easy.